Tonight, we'll be talking about Afghan arrivals to Chicagoland and how together we can build communities of love and welcome for our newly arriving neighbors. For over 40 years, World Relief Chicagoland has been welcoming refugees and immigrants and helping them rebuild their lives in the wake of tragedy. Tragedies like extreme poverty, persecution, and war. But together, we have been helping them find a place of belonging here in Chicagoland. Rebuilding means helping refugees and immigrants find housing, prepare for and obtain jobs, learn English, enroll their children in school, become citizens, undergo trauma counseling, and so much more. In partnership with people like you, with churches and the broader community, we are committed to walking alongside refugees and immigrants from a the moment they arrive at the airport for the many years ahead um, as it takes, as they become more fully a part of the community. And tonight, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you some of what that journey looks like. So I want us to start by introducing our panelists. And I'm going to start with a pretty simple question. I would love for you to share your name, how long you've been connected to World Relief, what is your role, and if you want to throw in your favorite holiday food or tradition, you're welcome to do that. So, Neela, would you start us off? Sure. So my name is Neela Malik. And I am an Afghan case manager. I've been with Relief since October. And my favorite holiday is Thanksgiving. Mm, that's one of my favorites. Yes. <laughs> and it's soon, which is nice. I know. Yeah, my name is Matt Sorns. I uh, started with World Relief as an intern when I was a Wheaton College student in Nicaragua and then joined our staff here in Chicagoland in 2006. And um, now for about the last 10 years, I've actually been on World Relief's national staff, but still here from the Chicagoland area out of Aurora. And favorite holiday tradition. Um, we do this thing in my family on Christmas Eve where we uh, eat uh, steak fondue. So we, it's like mm-hmm. oil where you cook your meat in, this, in the oil. And that's like a, that we have to do that Christmas Eve. Oh, can I get an invite? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, no pressure. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Well, I'm Susan Sperry. I'm the executive director here at uh, World Relief in Chicagoland, our three office locations. And I've been with World Relief, um, like Matt, started as an intern and volunteer and then have been on staff with World Relief for about 20 years. And um, one of my favorite Christmas traditions is on also Christmas Eve, where my family of Swedish origin has this tremendous spread of meats and cheeses and rice pudding. Mm-hmm. and Christmas cookies. And that's a fun nice. time. Nice. And I am Tomomo Gary, the Family Case Management Assistant Manager and the Immigrant Church Liaison. Um, my beginning at World Relief started as a client, not as a staff. So I came as a refugee myself and um, have been here 12 years so far on staff. Um, my favorite tradition of... Um, my holiday would be baking, just like you, Nathan, but it is not a Dutch cookie. <laughs> Mine is African slash, I would say, North African Mediterranean, because you, as a kid, I would eat the raw dough before it is baked. I was fun part of it. That's, that's true for me, too. <laughs> that was one of the best parts. So, I forgot to mention, I've been on World Relief staff for a little over a year. Um, but actually would love to hear from you. So in the chat, feel free to put in how long you've been connected with World Relief, whether that's just a couple of months or a few decades or for volunteering. We'd love to hear. So feel free to pop that in the chat. But let's um, go ahead and get into our discussion tonight. Um, I want to start with a first question that's going to be for Matt. Can you tell us a little bit about the people who are coming to the United States, many of whom are coming here to Chicago? Sure. Yeah. So uh, you know, as you said, we've been doing this in, at World Relief here in Chicago and in other parts of the country for about 40 years now, where we've been working with the U.S. government to resettle refugees, serving lots of other immigrants as well. Um, as most people are probably aware who've been following our work, the number of refugees allowed in the United States has gone down pretty significantly in the last five years or so. But we are starting to see that pick up again, and um, primarily because of the arrival of Afghans um, just since August with the, mm-hmm. the fall of Kabul. Um, but we are also still continuing to see other refugees from other locations arrive, from, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, from Burma, from Ukraine, from various parts of the world. Um, so we're, uh, it's very, you know, it's a challenge. There's a lot of people arriving after a season of not many arriving, but it's also an incredible opportunity. And we're excited to be able to welcome people. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, Neil, I'm going to jump to you for the next question. 
So in your role, you're providing support to many of the people who are coming from Afghanistan. Yes. Can you tell us about the Afghan people that you um, are meeting and mostly what they've gone through, um, but really, really focusing on what are some of the challenges um, that they are facing and their experience in arriving to the U.S.? Yes, Nate. So people who come from Afghanistan, they're people who have dreams just like you and me in every single American in the U.S. Um, they're people who work their entire lives to build a home for themselves and their families. Um, they're people who um, are very, um, hus- uh, they do, uh, they're very ho- good at hospitality. Um, people who would um, share their food with you, even if they don't have enough for themselves. They're people that would welcome you with their open arm when you go to their houses. So these are the people who come here leaving everything behind. Um, their job, their lives, their uh, families, friends, everything that they've built for themselves. Um, when you really meet them, um, you actually see the, the sense of what they're going through on their expressions. Um, for example, you can see the sense of, well, being happy for being here and safe, but also sadness because of everything that they've gone through and leaving everything behind. Um, some of the challenges that they actually face uh, coming here are, in my opinion, linguistic and cultural. Those are the two, two main challenges. Uh, not being able to understand English or speak English or not e- really be able to do anything or know anything. Um, the do's and don'ts of this culture. So those are the things that they're actually facing when they come, come here. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I know those are um, not small struggles. No, these are, yeah. these are big struggles. Yes. Yeah. Um, Dramoma, I'm going to jump over to you. You've been with World Week for some time. You have some good experience here. Can you share with us a little bit about what happens in the first week of a newly arriving family's journey here in Chicago? Uh, the first week after arrival of a refugee family is an extremely busy one uh, because um, the next thing that happens after arrival, we have a caseworker who visits them within the first 24 hours in the country. So we leave the staff would go sit down, check on them, and make sure everything is okay. You know, the apartment is well, and they have a comfortable place, they are feeling safe. It's just a safety check on them. Mm-hmm. And then the next day after that, we're hitting the road with them. What that means is, okay, we're starting medical, you know, there is a medical screen that they have to go through because we want to make sure everyone is healthy because we want them to live a healthy life as well. Uh, at the same time, we're thinking about, okay, um, uh, refugees, when they arrive, they're eligible for some public benefits and we start the application right away to apply it to them so that we make sure they have the benefits that they, they are eligible for. Then at the same time, we're thinking about ESL classes, you know, most of these people are coming from places where English is not their first language. So we have ESL registration going on. At the same time as ESL is going on, we're looking to early childhood for their children as well. It goes alongside the ESL. And the ESL uh, eventually will end up into a job class and the job class will prepare them for the first job. So it is a long line of things that we do. It starts with that all the way up to employment where we're able to secure them a full-time job that they will be able to provide for themselves and eventually get even off public benefits. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot packed in the first week. It's an incredible kind of uh, launching, you could say. And, you know, as as you have known and as you have known too, we've walked with um, immigrants and refugees for a long time um, beyond that. And um, we talk a lot about the idea of someone growing to a point of thriving. So, Nilab, I have a question for you. Um, when you think about the Afghan community here in Chicago land, what does it look like to see a family thriving? And if you'd be willing, could you perhaps share some, share some of your own experience? Uh, yes, Nathan. So um, America is a country I call a skies the limit. So um, whatever you want to do and whoever you want to be, you can be in this country. It just depends on your sense of determination. Um, for example, I'll, I will use my experience. I came as a refugee um, back in 2001, right after September 11. 
And uh, there are many challenges that I myself faced. And uh, one of which was that being a Muslim and uh, being from a Middle Eastern country, um, I was not welcome with an open arm. And especially in high school, people would not talk to me. Uh, Mm -hmm. Other students will stay away from me. Um, And there were many instances, one of which a student came to me and just said, you're related to Osama bin Laden. You need to go back to your own country. Um, so and I had to explain to them that, first of all, Osama bin Laden is not from Afghanistan. Um, he's from Saudi Arabia, that part of the country. And um, so I had to explain, I felt like I have to explain to everybody individually that I am not related. I'm not a terrorist. I'm a human being just like everybody else in this country. Um, and then uh, not being able to understand and speak the English language was very hard for me. Um, so when I was li- living with my host family, um, the way I would communicate with them was to point at things or draw on the piece of paper to make them understand what I want and what I need. Um, and then I, to furthermore uh, get my English better, I would uh, take many ESL classes in high school and uh, I would... Um, check out books uh, from the library. My favorite genre was horror book. And I would read that. And then I would um, study using English dictionary, not English to Farsi, but just the English dictionary. And then being a full-time high school student, then I had to work full-time as well to support my family. So there were times that I would come home from, from school. I mean, actually I would go to work straight from high school and then I would come home I would lay on the floor trying to do my homework and I'll actually fall asleep. Mm-hmm. It would be like 10, 11 at night. And then my mom would wake me up and say, hey, Neil, you need to go to, your, to bed. And then I would wake up early in the morning. Oh my goodness, I didn't finish my homework last night. So then I would run to my classes early in the morning, skipping my breakfast mm-hmm. to get help from my teachers to do my, finish my homework. So those are the things that I faced when I first came as a refugee. But then none of that actually made me weak or feel sorry for myself because I knew that was temporary. Um, So it takes the sense of determination to work hard and then you can reach your goal. Um, So those are the things that I I feel like any Afghan at first when they come, it's hard, but then they will reach their goal eventually as they work hard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks for sharing that. It's not a small thing for us to to hear that and to to be honored by you sharing that with us. Thank you. um, Yeah, thank you for helping all of us learn a little bit more. Of course, of course. um, Zooming out a little bit more, right? I want to turn to Susan and ask you a question. Um, Can you speak to the broader community of World Relief? And what is our role in walking alongside of newly arriving families as they find a place of belonging here? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, Mila, you spoke so beautifully about the importance of hard work and 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 then the teacher and the teachers who are helping you. And I think so many of us, um, so many of you who join us here today are a part of this broad community of people who, who um, are coming alongside newcomers to our community to, to create welcome and to journey forward um, with uh, refugees and immigrants. And we all need that, uh, that community of um, of people to journey with us in life, um, who are family and friends, teachers and um, faith communities and so forth. And at World Relief, that is a tremendous value that we have, um, is partnering with uh, local churches, volunteers, community organizations, faith communities uh, to, to um, walk alongside refugees and immigrants. And when, uh, when Kabul fell a few months ago, we began to see a tremendous outpouring of that support mm-hmm. from, uh, from across our communities. And I want to share just, just a few ways that's looked. Um, we've seen over 1,100 inquiries from people who wanted to volunteer or give in response to the needs of Afghans who are coming to the U.S., um, which has been just incredible. You said 1,100. Um, 1,100. Yes. Yeah. Um, we expect about 80 groups so far to, who either have or will be collecting all of the items needed for households. And by that, just to break it down, one, one of those groups delivered three U-Haul truckloads of items for households. So that also just tremendous outpouring of support. Uh, there's 133 people who have 
uh, who are currently volunteering with us to help set up apartments for mm -hmm. refugees um, when they first arrive. And 79 people who are volunteering to pick people up at the airport when they arrive. And those, I, I just, those numbers are um, just a, a small picture of the number of volunteers who are helping with tutoring and mm -hmm. becoming friendship partners and helping in so many other ways. Uh, we've, over the last few months, uh, connected with over 150 churches and faith communities who have reached out to learn more, to mobilize some of the support that I just described, and um, and to explore how they can serve Afghans and other refugees and immigrants in our communities. And, and then many, many of you uh, who joined us tonight, as well as uh, many community members, have uh, have spoken up to our elected officials and have advocated for um, for good policies for Afghans who are arriving now, and have advocated for uh, for those who are still in Afghanistan and need a way out, need uh, still need to be evacuated. I could go on and on. Clearly, I already have, but we're <laughs> we're seeing a tremendous outpouring of support, mm -hmm. um, such generosity um, of giving, uh, sacrificial giving from so many of our partners. And um, as I as I think about what um, what welcome and what what uh, sacrifice looks like, just on a day to day basis, one one story um, actually from one of our coworkers comes to mind, and she she was sharing not too long ago about. Uh, walking into a school and doing a school tour with a new family from Afghanistan. And as they took this tour, uh, students came out and said, hi, welcome. And teachers said, welcome. And you love such a contrast to what you shared. Definitely. Um, yes. Big difference. Yeah. And, and just the, the impact that, that this had um, of, uh, it's such a small action, right? People saying welcome, people just just being warm, but um, but that makes such a difference. And and that's um, that's the power of community when mm -hmm. when we're at our best, coming alongside um, those who are new to our community and coming alongside each other to to have those moments where we say welcome. Yeah, and that's a community I think we want to be a part of. Right? Yeah, we want to be a welcoming community at our core, and I know we know you do too. And I think that's just yeah, that's a beautiful picture. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, um, Matt, I have a want to zoom kind of back out a little bit, and I'd love to um, to hear from you. For those of us who share the Christian faith as a motivation for why we welcome refugees and immigrants from other parts of the world, um, what? Yeah, how does our faith commitment inspire us to do that? Yeah, it's a great question. I realized too, in introducing myself, I did forget the part about my my job title. Oh. So. A big part of my job, actually, at the national level is working with churches and church partners, um, not as much doing the how of welcoming new families. That's what we do um, here at the local level, but more of the why. And I think we could spend you know, a whole sermon on that, but just a few key biblical points. Um, one starts with the great commandment. Uh, Jesus is asked at one point, well, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, it's to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbors yourself. And then he makes really clear as he, he's asked by this legal scholar, well, who is my neighbor? He tells a story that we think of as the Good Samaritan. And that makes pretty clear because this was presumably a Jewish person beaten up on the side of the road to Jericho who's in need, a traveler. And when a priest and a Levite walk by on the other side, it is a Samaritan, somewhat of a different ethnicity, a different religion, who sees him in need and has compassion on him. And Jesus says to go and do likewise. Uh, Another core biblical principle that motivates us at World Relief, and I think for a lot of the churches we work with, is the idea of, of people being made in the image of God. And that is, uh, there's no exceptions to that. If you're a human person, you're made in the image of God. And that means that human life has value, has, has dignity. It gives us the motivation, you know, when people are fleeing persecution, whether from the Taliban or from anywhere, we have a strong motivation to do whatever we reasonably could to protect that life. But not only are people made with, with dignity, they're also made with potential in the image of a creator. I love that. And I think that's worth reminding because sometimes our conversations about refugees or immigration in this country very quickly go to, well, what is this going to cost us? You know, how many jobs are those people going to take? Those are all fair questions. And economists have looked at those questions, but they're really only fair questions if we're concurrently asking, well, how many jobs are they going to create? How are they going to contribute? And actually, historically, 
you know, immigrants have contributed in immense ways, including refugees, um, to the United States and to our community here in Chicagoland, economically as well as culturally. Um, and all that's rooted in that idea of people being made in God's image. The, the last thing I would say is on the idea of hospitality. And hospitality is, you know, in the English language, the way we use that word in the U.S., we might think of hospitality as like having our friends over for a meal or having our relatives stay in the guest room. You know, we're going to wash the sheets and the towels or maybe even as an industry, like hospitality is hotels and restaurants. But in the Greek of the New Testament, hospitality is philoxenia. It is the love of strangers, mm. which frankly is not necessarily a, a value of our culture. We, if anything, we hear strangers and we think stranger danger, like strangers are people to be afraid of. I heard that growing up. Uh, and yet, yeah, I mean, it was like Sunday, Saturday morning cartoons, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but biblically, the, the command in Romans 12 and elsewhere is to practice hospitality, literally to practice loving strangers. In Hebrews 13, we're told that some people by welcoming strangers have entertained angels without realizing it. And certainly that's been our experience here at World Relief over decades that I don't know if they're angels or not, but certainly that immigrants have been a blessing to our community. And in some ways, like, this goes to what you were mentioning, Elab. My mentors and teachers in the idea of hospitality have been some of my immigrant neighbors who, mm -hmm. like, in, in unlike what is normal for our culture here, literally, you know, I'm walking down the street and my neighbor will call out and say, hey, you need to try this food I made. And, you know, incredible foods from all over the world, um, from folks from Afghanistan and from various other cultures as well. So I think we have an opportunity as the church to learn from our immigrant brothers and sisters and neighbors as well. Yeah. Thank you for that. It does. It does sound like there's so much more to be unpacked on that topic. Mm -hmm. so, um, well, we want to also give space for you to be able to ask some of your questions. So um, I have another question for our group, but um, please use the Q&A function or put in the chat some of the questions and we'll... We'll start gathering those together. But my, my last question, and this is for each of you, um, is while those who are viewing are sending in their questions, can you, can you share a few ways that we can love our Afghan neighbors well? Yes, so um, there are many ways, but some of the, which I have seen is um, the way we can make our Afghans love is to be empathizing with them and make them feel at home. Mm -hmm. um, to, um, and one of, one of the way that here we, uh, in the world belief, we do that is by culturally, um, appropriate meal, we're getting ready for them for the first night when they arrive, we get that ready for them and provide that for them. So that way they don't feel like being away from, from their country, coming to a brand like new country, strange country, um, not knowing what to expect, uh, like food wise. So then that mm -hmm. way they can feel a little bit at ease by eating their own food. Um, mm -hmm. And then also another way that we can help uh, make our uh, Afghan family feel loved is by not, not letting another girl or another family per se go through what I went through. Mm -hmm. uh, not telling them, hey, you, we're going to look at you different because you're Muslim, or we're going to look at you differently because uh, you're not from our culture, from, you're from a different country. So those are the things that we have, because, because I went through a lot, and I'm badly scarred, um, and I don't want another family to go through that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And thanks for sharing that with us. Of course. And I love how it's, there's still like the, the tangible differences. Those little differences add up to make a big difference over time. Of course. Like little moments of welcome. Yes. Are key. So thank, yeah, thank you for that. You're welcome. Would others like to, to share to answer the question of what's one thing we can do to love our African neighbors as well? You know, let me just start a little bit from where Matt uh, took us to the big picture of, you know, giving us the biblical background and everything. But let me take us on a journey uh, just down to the personal level of our own involvement, because as we heard, uh, we have hundreds of Afghanis coming into our neighborhoods, uh, whether that being into your apartment complex where you live or maybe across the street from your house. And um, what I'm trying to, to ask all of us to be part of is when you see an Afghani or when you see someone from different culture, maybe across the hall from your apartment, would you take the time and just walk to them and say, hey, you know, I am so-and-so. My mm -hmm. name is John. My name is Smith. You know, I live in this apartment. What's your name? 
Uh, is there any way we can make that happen? Because I'm saying this because I know we live in this culture that really tells us to keep everyone at an arm distance away from us. Mm-hmm. And it goes back to what Nathan said, you know, stranger, danger. <laughs> but is this Afghani friend who just moved to the neighborhood a danger? In, I would say he is not a danger for us or for anyone else. So he wants to make friends. And, and just to let you know, most of these people, most of these Afghanis, most of these refugees that are coming to us here have lived in the communities. They don't live the individual life that we live here. So for them not to know their neighbor across the street is so strange to them. For them not to know the person who lives down the hallway from their apartment is completely strange. So when you walk to someone, to a new Afghani, and you tell them, hey, this is me, my name is John, you make them feel at home. You, you make them to break the barrier of the loneliness feeling that they have been going through. Even though it might have cost you 30 seconds only to say hi, you are helping them. It is huge for them. So you are doing a big work by doing that. You are making them feel welcome just by saying hi, I am so-and-so. So let us try that. And I tell you, I promise you, the result will always be good. Trust me, it will be good. Mm. That's a good word. That's good. You know, I, I would say one way we love our neighbors, absolutely affirming everything we've just said, but there are also our sort of, if you zoom out a bit, some structural ways we do that. I, you know, I started talking about the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Martin Luther King Jr. was once preaching on that, that topic, and he, to paraphrase him, he basically said, of, of course, if you love your neighbor, you're going to help the guy beaten up on the side of the road to Jericho. But if the next day someone else is beaten up on the side of the road to Jericho, and the next day someone else is beaten up on the side of the road to Jericho, at a certain point, loving our neighbor means asking the question of what's wrong with this road. And, mm-hmm. and I think what Dr. King is saying there is sometimes there are structural barriers to people flourishing. And if we really love people well, we, we both are going to do the individual relational level work, but also be willing to speak to the, the structures that aren't working well. So uh, with refugees in particular, or with Afghans in particular, I'd say there's two big policy issues that are, we're facing right now. One is that for the Afghans who are arriving, most, though they are fleeing persecution, so they're, they basically meet the definition of a refugee, they're not being brought to the U.S. through the formal refugee resettlement process. That was basically a decision that makes sense because there was a need to get people in quickly. The downside of that is unlike someone who settled as a refugee who one year after arrival can apply for their green card, for their permanent legal status, and it's on a path to citizenship, these parolees are not on that path. They are in an indefinite temporary status that they may be able to renew. They're lawfully present, but they could have to renew that every, every couple of years. And we don't want people stuck in that sort of perpetual temporary status. So we'd love to see the Congress pass legislation to allow them to apply for permanent legal status. Uh, I would also say, even as we are really eager to welcome people who are arriving, we're very mindful that for the many people who got out before the U.S. withdrew, withdrew its military presence from Afghanistan at the end of August, many others did not get out, including a lot of people who are uniquely vulnerable, whether because of their service to the U.S. military or some other part of the U.S. government, because they're a religious minority, an ethnic minority, or they're a woman leader. There's various categories who are uniquely at risk with the Taliban. And we have not stopped advocating with the government, the U.S. government to say, you still have an obligation to do whatever is humanly possible to get out those who are at risk in Afghanistan now. This is good. (laughs) Exclamation point. (laughs) Everything you all have shared. And I I think a couple of um, practical ways to come alongside our Afghan neighbors uh, right now. I shared earlier that we've had a lot of people volunteer to help with apartment setups or airport pickups, but we need more. And very specifically, we need more people in Chicago to help with apartment setups. And we need more people in Aurora or near Aurora to help with airport pickups. And so if you, um, if you happen to know someone or can help spread the word, um, you all are are already faithful partners serving in so many ways, um, but those are a couple of very tangible ways that we're, we're seeking uh, more support uh, to come alongside our Afghan neighbors right now. And uh, we, we talk a lot about, about donations and always on our website, we keep, we keep um, updated the household items that are most in need. Uh, so invite you to, to look at that. 
Um, but I, I just want to highlight what, what you all have shared about sometimes the ways that don't seem more, most obvious. I, I've just mentioned a couple of very tangible things we can do. I, I just what you shared about the, how we live our lives is, is what, what matters so much. Um, living our lives with this, these intentional steps forward toward um, being welcoming, saying hi, um, showing empathy, being curious, listening. I think though those are the the habitual um, uh, lifestyle choices that we mm-hmm. make uh, to to create welcome um, and making that decision to for people of faith um, to pray and to to seek both what God would have us do and also to to pray for our neighbors and um, for those who are adjusting to a new place. Yeah, I love that that little statement. Of stay curious, right? Like I think that it's. Yeah, there's moments of curiosity we can have through everyday life, right? To stay curious about how can I how can I learn and be a better um, contributor to a community of welcome. So thank all of you so much for for answering those questions. Um, we have some questions that have come in, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and jump us to the first one. And the first one, and anyone can answer, of course. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the unique aspects of Afghan culture? So, so this is really amazing because uh, I'm sure all of you have heard or not. So Afghan food, especially that one is called Kabuli Palau is amazing. It's basically, I'm going to give a little bit of a introduction. So that it's a rice and then some raisin and carrot on top some, and then there's some, Usually we put uh, lamb or goat meat under the rice. Um, it's very popular. Everybody loves it, including me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so our food is very different. So we use many different spices as, a, uh, as compared to American food. It's, uh, it's not as spicy and I don't think it's a lot of spices used. So uh, we use a lot of spices. Uh, the other um, differences in our, the way we wear traditional clothes um, it's really beautiful, very elegant, elegant. It's head to toe, a lot of work done to it. Um, so, so yeah, so that's different. And then as far as other, uh, differences, um, actually I'm going to use myself as an example again. Uh, when I first came <laughs> to the high school and, uh, the way how, um, back home, uh, I've never been to, to school back home because of Taliban and everything, but the way how it works is like, when the teacher comes in the classroom, you are just sitting down quiet. You can't even talk without the teacher's permission. So when I came to high school here, um, the way how they treat their teacher, like, I'm sorry, but one of the students was like, hey, dude, to the teacher, my (laughs) mouth dropped open. I'm like, if I say, hey, dude, to my teacher back home, God forbid, it will be like a big thing, you know? So these are the different uh, things that I had to learn. And I'm sure every Afghan had to go through that too. So those mm-hmm. are the differences. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for giving us that small window into like a very beautiful and rich culture. Of course. That's awesome. Um, next question is, um, what are some of the ages of the Afghans who are arriving in general and maybe perhaps to some of the Chicago land? So um, yeah, I'm curious if we have that information in this group. It is a... Um, variety of ages, ages and yeah, Nila, who's working with many people, feel free to chime in, but every age from elderly to um, uh, newborn or baby. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's right there. Um, we had one family who, um, who was pregnant and uh, she gave birth at the base. And we have another family who's also pregnant and doing a month. Um, so we do see some, uh, Young, mainly younger couples, some older, um, money, infants, and young children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think nationally, uh, I don't know if this will exactly translate locally, but it's about half of the Afghans who come are children. Mm-hmm. So I think that's important for people to realize. We're talking about a lot of families, mm-hmm. sometimes families with large, you know, large families. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, you know, that makes housing an additional challenge as well. If it's a family of six or seven. Definitely. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm glad we had that info here. Um, I'm going to jump us to the next question, and this one is about the, uh, the housing situation 
So can we uh, get kind of an update on what we're seeing in regards to affordable housing within Chicagoland? And are there ways that people can help with that? Oh, yes. I think we're all looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, all right, well, Dermomo and Nila, please do chime in. So uh, housing continues uh, to be a tremendous challenge and uh, we, we don't, um, we're not finding very much affordable, available housing. Uh, we have had uh, some recent um, breakthroughs, but these days breakthroughs are, we found um, an apartment unit or an apartment building who's willing to, to lease to newly arrived families. Um, so those are very exciting moments. Uh, we need so much more housing than we found. Uh, we have, there's families who are, are living in hotels right now because uh, we haven't been able to find permanent housing. So, and I'll, I'll stress that permanent housing is the need. Uh, we have, I believe Nathan on our, our blog uh, mm -hmm. this past week on our website, we, um, we shared an article that lists a number of very specific locations that we're looking for housing because Chicagoland is big and um, resettlement works best when we're able to really focus our resettlement resources in specific communities. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a list of communities that we're, that we're intensely and especially looking for, for housing in. So we'd welcome leads to landlords um, in those areas. And if, if, you have, if there's other ideas, um, we're glad to hear them, but specifically we're focused in those uh, specific geographic locations, which are all near our current offices. Um, so that, that's a little of what, uh, it's still hard. Uh, we're still looking. Um, and I, we expect this to be the situation for quite some time because there, there's um, just a scarcity of available affordable housing, housing for many reasons. Uh, right now that this existed prior to the pandemic, but has gotten um, much worse, acutely worse um, as, as we continue to move forward um, in pandemic recovery. Yeah. And we can, um, in our follow-up email, we'll make sure to link that blog that you referenced as well as other pathways for how to help with that. But, Dermomo, were you about to share something? Yeah, just to add to that a little bit to what Susan shared, because the question said affordable housing. Housing in general is not available. Forget about it being affordable. Mm -hmm. So because housing is not there, there is not affordable housing. Yeah. And, and that is leading us to where we have not been before because since there is no housing, even if we're able to find one, it is not affordable. Mm -hmm. And that is a new challenge for us as, as an organization to step into that direction that now there is more money that needs to go towards housing. And when you are placing a newly arrived family with this very expensive rent, it makes us feel like we're setting them up for failure. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 you know, it is a pain for us to go through that. So for this reason, we, 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 we are looking some, through some creative ways to have some agencies, some folks who will come along and help us carry this load and Nathan, you know about that better than myself, because this is something that we're really working on. It's so hard just to have housing because affordability of housing is almost non-existent now because we don't have enough housing in the market. Today. Yeah. So it is quite a challenge. Uh, we need a lot of help with housing and it remains a tough challenge. That is my own opinion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's important to know this is a, the challenge nationwide. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. um, when we think about resettlement, we often think, okay, where where can that be done well, um, mm -hmm. and where is a housing affordable and available? But mm -hmm. this this is a challenge that we're hearing about from our colleagues all across the country. And I mean, to add to that, it's true for any of us who wants to rent an apartment. It might be a hard time to find that. But then you're at this narrow subset of landlords who want to rent to someone who's not actually here. I mean, we're trying to get this in advance of their arrival if possible, who doesn't have a job yet, though we can promise them we're really good at getting people jobs. We've had a great track record of that. And who doesn't have a credit history. So, I mean, if there are folks who are landlords or have an extra property that could rent at a reasonable rate, that would be a huge way to help, especially in those specific geographies right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good time for our community to come together and as we have before, provide a space of welcome. So um, jumping along to our next question that's coming, and thank you all so much for these questions. It's been great to, to have some, um, some good thought behind them. I'm 
curious about this one. What is the best way for people to connect with individual families and build relationships? So I, I hear maybe two parts to that. One, one is that how, how to maybe sign mm-hmm. up and connect, but also then once at, as you build a relationship, what is that best way to, to connect and um, how to foster a relationship? Dermoma, do you want to speak a little bit to how to, how to foster a, a good relationship? Yeah, um, we, we have many opportunities to help someone to be involved with a family. Uh, but usually what we do here, we then tell you what you should do. But we provide you with all of the options that we have and you choose which one fits your lifestyle. Uh, we have folks who have younger families, they have children, they may want to be connected with a family that have kids the same age, they have own kids. We have people who are in the different stage of life. Maybe they just need a friendship partner, someone that they can come along maybe once a week and help them maybe read a letter or do something with them. So each, each individual person has something to offer. Mm-hmm. And, and we don't tell you what to do, as I said earlier. So first thing I would say, you know what, just get on that website, fill the paperwork, we will get you the training because one thing we want to make sure, we don't want you to get burned out. It is something that we, we take it so serious and we want to protect you because we need you uh, because we can do what we are doing without volunteers. We just want to, want to put this out there. We do what we do because of the volunteers that are behind us, that are coming alongside us to do this work. So you start getting on, on our website, fill the paperwork, and then we will train you and provide you with so many options. You have multiple choice and choose the one that would fit your lifestyle. And we will be more than happy to get you involved. Yeah, and we'll also include the, the link to how to get engaged as a volunteer in, mm-hmm. in our follow-up email. So mm-hmm. don't go searching for it now. It'll, it'll be coming to you shortly. Um, the next question is, does World Relief help connect refugees with mental health resources as part of helping them get settled? And why is that an important, mm-hmm. why would that, yeah, why is that an important? Actually, that's my own addition. I would just love for us to share a little bit about why that's so important. So... I, uh, yeah, you start, <laughs> I'll, I'll finish. You know, at, at World Live Chicago Land, we have an entire department that works for mental health folks. And uh, this is something that we, we believe in it. And it is part of the holistic ministry that we provide for all of our clients, Afghanis, whoever comes through our door and we feel that they need help to see a counselor and they have some sort of a mental health issue that they need help with, we have the service for that. And, you know, we deal with people who are coming from war-torn zones, and and we know there is a lot of PTSD and things like that. So we have the folks who are ready to take them and and walk with them and see how we can provide help for them. So, yes, we do have an entire department that is equipped for that. there is a lot of work we put into that. And um, yes, yeah. we have the service. And we're hiring in that department right now. Mm-hmm. So that that's um, also a request to spread the word. Uh, we're looking for, uh, for licensed counselors and um, the folks with um, uh, background in working across cultures. And uh, we also partner with other organizations because we, um, we know that counseling is a huge need. Um, we, we aim to meet some of that, but there's a, there's a lot more than what we can do. So mm-hmm. we, um, there's a number of amazing partners we could, we could share and name. Uh, but one thing also that we're, we're seeing right now, um, specific to, to the um, Afghan uh, families who are resettling is people who have fled very recent mm-hmm. trauma. And that we, we are seeing and expecting that there's need um, a different kind of therapeutic response than, than sometimes we've been used to providing uh, for refugees who, who have fled trauma, but have sometimes been in, waiting for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so the, the, need is, um, the need is significant. Uh, we're exploring a lot of uh, uh, groups in the future, um, group programs that 
aren't, aren't our traditional mental health counseling that we're used to in the West where we sit across from each other. Um, that's not always the approach that our therapists take. Um, there's, there's a lot that we, that we do in group sessions that, that just talk about adjustment, talk about the culture and create safe space for, for people to, um, to talk about what, what that experience is like to be able to, um, or to be adjusting in the U S Mm -hmm. uh, but then perhaps also bring up some, um, some of what uh, they've left behind mm -hmm. as well in a safe, safe cities. So I'm going to add to that because of the need. The question was why. So um, I actually had experiences. It was my first week or second week being in World Relief. And I had to translate uh, or interpret for this, this mom, single mom who came here and uh, so she was having a hard time accepting um, housing and stuff like that. So then I had to, I tried to make her understand and try to explain everything. But then I figure out, I found out that I had to come to her level in order, in order to connect with her to get her to understand me and get to know that I understand. So then she started crying and she had gone through a lot of trauma in her life. Um, not just the recent trauma, but prior to that. And then honestly, it made me cry. I started bawling with her because I connected with her because I've been through some stuff myself too. So um, it's very important. It's also a very sensitive topic for them. So you yep. can't go to them and say, hey, I'm going to take you to counseling. Yep. Um, I've heard when I came as a refugee back then, uh, when that idea was presented to some of the refugee family, their, their response was like, I'm not crazy. I'm not insane. I don't need it. But so it has, it's a very sensitive topic the way we present it. It should be very in a way where like, they don't feel like we are calling them insane or, or crazy, but yeah, they're gone through a lot of trauma and it's very helpful for them. Yeah. yeah. And so I would just add to that, you know, the sort of sensitive culturally informed counseling that we're able to provide here at World Relief Chicago and is actually really unique nationally in terms of refugee resettlement. It doesn't exist everywhere. That's actually a huge gap in, I think, the resettlement program in the United States. It's something that's possible here really because of the support of amazing people um, in our community who help make that possible. And it's something we want to sustain and frankly see in other parts of the country as families are resettled as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for all of that, each of you. Um, we probably have time for maybe one more question. So. Um, this last one that came in, and the, the question is, how much is um, how much is government helping with each of these challenges? How long is that available? Uh, yeah, I, think I can take that one. Um, so, uh, resettlement, refugee resettlement, and the Afghan resettlement is a public-private partnership, and that's that's the way that the U.S. government has set it up, and. Uh, World Relief, of course, resettlement is one aspect of what we do uh, to welcome refugees. And then we serve immigrants in so many, so many other ways long term. And what we observe is that that government assistance is um, very focused and heavy, particularly in that the first uh, three to six months after arrival. Mm -hmm. And so the government, um, because of the evolving nature of the Afghan crisis, the government um, initially set up a short term 90 day program to assist Afghans and now is using the mechanisms the government has set up for, um, for refugee resettlement to, um, to really uh, uh, be able to distribute more funding to organizations like World Relief um, to support Afghans. So we, we are receiving um, support and services from the government, but as with refugee resettlement, it's, um, it's not sufficient for all of the needs that refugees have when they first arrive. And, that's certainly the case with Afghans. Um, it's, I'd, I'd also add that it's evolving. So we're, we're continuing to, um, particularly with the housing crisis, um, work with our government partners to figure out um, what, what are the creative options, including um, longer term rental assistance, perhaps um, incentives, for, uh, incentives for landlords, what, what can be done to, um, to create more available housing. So th those are ongoing discussions. Um, there's literally the, the, the picture um, can change every week uh, mm -hmm. with 
with what we're seeing or hearing from, from government partners, uh, particularly as it relates to housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for it. Yeah. the good quick synopsis. I think making it, it's something very complicated. Very but, complicated, yeah. Uh, happy, yeah, happy to talk more about that. Yeah, and of course, you can always reach out to us. You know, you'll get an email soon that'll have contact information and we can give you any more clarification. Um, we're happy to do that. Um, but I believe we are beginning to run short on time. So thank you all so much for your willingness to answer some questions, to be on the spot, and, um, help communicate um, to our partners. And thank you so much again for uh, bringing your questions and, and being a part of this. Um, my hope, you know, is that you have been encouraged by the impact that you are creating and that you have also been inspired to keep moving forward together. As we wrap up this evening, I just want to share where we are going over the next few months um, to come and this year where we expect, or yeah, where we're heading over the next few months. So this year, we expect to welcome over 270 Afghans and hundreds more refugees from other parts of the world. Um, to put that into a little bit of perspective, um, in September of this year, we resettled over 40 refugees, which was the most that we have resettled since January of 2017. And since October 1st, together we've resettled over 125 Afghans, and we expect another 150 in the next few months. Last year, during the same October to November, or October to now window, we resettled two people. Um, so there is so much to do. There is so much need. There is a lot going on. In the weeks and in the months ahead, volunteers will set up countless apartments and they'll greet new arrivals at the airport. Transportation assistants will take families to medical appointments. Youth will receive support from mentors and navigate the challenges of school. Students will be enrolled in English classes. Good neighbor teams will walk alongside families. And you are some of these people. And thank you for that. And I want to say, like, if that feels like a lot, if that feels like there's just so much going on, it's, it's because it is, but that comes from a place of wanting to care for the whole person. We know you care about that and we care about that too. And we've been reminded that while creating change isn't an easy thing to do, it's possible when we do this together. So time and time again, you have embodied what it means to build welcoming communities where refugees and immigrants can thrive. As we enter into this holiday season, we want to invite you to partner with us again in giving. Your support will go to helping hundreds of Afghans and others arriving from all around the world as they rebuild their lives here in the Chicagoland area. It will go to coordinating and equipping volunteers um, and to make an impact that lasts. You can give by going to worldrelief.org slash Chicagoland slash donate. The information will also be available in the chat and on the screen at the end of the event. But I just really want to say thank you for all the ways that you have stepped up this past year. And from each of us here, we are so remarkably grateful for your partnership. We could not do this without you. So on that note, I just want to say we hope you have a great night, a blessed night, and we will see you soon. Thank you.